I start by asking you to tell me about your decision to shut down Lava Bit as it used to be? Okay. Um, it was it was one of those very difficult decisions to make um, because I, for me, I had to weigh a couple of things. Um, I had to weigh the ethics of turning over those SSL keys to the government without any ability to control what information they look at or access. Um, because once I, of course, turned over those keys, uh, without any supervision, they would have been able to collect and, and analyze all of the information coming in and out of my network for all 400,000 of my users. And, of course, I had an ethical problem with that because I didn't get into the business of becoming an email service provider just to become a listening post for the federal government. And I had to weigh that against my beliefs in terms of the needs of law enforcement and my beliefs about what my users would want and about the cost, not the monetary cost, but the cost of 400,000 people suddenly losing access to their own messages, many of whom probably and certainly didn't have copies of those messages on their own computers, and not being able to warn them or even explain to them why I had to make my decision and hoping that they would understand. And it, it, was, it was one of those decisions that keeps you up at night and uh, makes your hair turn gray fall out. And it wasn't until I finally decided that the right thing to do was to shut down that I felt this sense of relief that I had made the right decision. And basically what my decision became was that if I didn't win the ability to tell people what was going on and win the ability to try and change the system to eliminate a secret law, I wasn't comfortable continuing to operate lava bit in this country. So if that was the case, then I felt like the right decision would be to shut down. So you went back and forth in court with the government a few times. I and still am. You were talking about some things you would be willing to do uh, to provide them some information. So, what exactly was the line you drew between what you were willing to do in terms of turning over information on your users and what you were not willing to do? And why did you draw the line there? Well, it came down to a couple of things. One, it came down to weighing again that equation between what the government was authorized to collect against the harm that I would be causing by shutting down the service suddenly. And I felt in the end, if it was a choice between protecting just the meta information of a handful of users against the harm or cost that would occur by shutting down the service for everyone, that the better of the two evils would be to figure out a way to collect that meta information and turn it over. And to me, the ultimate test was coming up with a solution or a compromise that would guarantee the only information that the government could access would be the information they were authorized to collect, which again was only meta information on a handful of accounts. And because they weren't willing to accept any of the compromises that would limit their access to just that information, I was really left with no choice but to assume that th what they really wanted to do was access the information of everyone, or access content, or collect passwords, or otherwise do something that they couldn't get the court to authorize, but do it in secret. So you said you felt a sense of relief. 
What has your life been like since then? Well, <clears throat> when I shut down the service, um, I immediately went into this backup mode. I wanted to uh, move all of the user information onto encrypted external drives so I could pull copies out of the data center. Um, I went through this process of writing the letter that I would later post on the website explaining my decision. I went through the chore of driving across town to the FBI field office in Dallas and dropping off the keys and talking to my lawyer and a couple of my friends. And when the process of backing up the user information was complete, it was the flip of a switch. And instead of getting my homepage, users would see a letter. And I took a deep breath. And having been awake for about 24 hours at that point, <laughs> I went into the other room and went to sleep. And slept quite well, if I do say so myself. And has your life been better since then, or worse? Better is always a subjective and very relative term. Um, my life has definitely been very different. I went from spending most of my day interfacing with a computer and my best friend, who happens to have four legs and a tail, to carpetbagging across the country trying to spread my message and my story in the hope that it would make a difference, that people would hear my voice, hear my story, understand what happened to me, and really push for something positive to come out of it. It's one thing to sacrifice your business. It's another thing to do it in vain and have nothing come out of it. That would have been a far greater cost at least to me personally. At least now, I can hold some solace in the fact that I have triggered a discussion. I have brought in, been able to, to raise resources from the public to fight this in court and hopefully set a precedent and really prevent this from happening to another business just like mine in the future. You know, the right for Americans to communicate with each other privately is just too important to a democracy to let slip away. And we have to do everything we can to protect that, legally, politically, and technologically. And, and even if, Well, I was going to say, and that's what I'm doing now. And if I, when things get tough, I just take, again, comfort in the fact that the battle I'm waging is just too important to stop, too important to let go of. And you've been fighting both legally and technologically. So let's start with legally. What exactly are you trying to establish uh, with your continuing litigation? I'm trying to establish effectively a precedent that says the federal government cannot come in and take the sensitive intellectual property, the trade secrets, if you will, of a business like LavaBit, who happens to be innocent, just in an effort to conduct secret surveillance against a sub suspect. That effectively, what I'm hoping is to say, as a business, I don't have an obligation to spy on my customers. And specifically, what this really means is that these SSL keys, which represent an, the online identity of a business and are used to secure the communications of its internet sites, can't be stolen, at least in secret, if the business has done nothing wrong. On the technology front, so, so just, uh, yeah. just to be clear then, 
are you saying that uh, you should not have to provide any information or that you should uh, be able to retain control of your SSL keys and just set up something to provide the specific information that the warrant says? That's actually an excellent question. Um, I'm saying that I should always be able to remain in control of my SSL keys and that if I have an obligation to turn over customer information, if I have an obligation to have the ability to collect customer information, then that is an obligation that needs to be established by an act of Congress. And that without that, I can build a system in which I don't have access to a user's communications. And in that world, I can offer that service and the government can't come in and force me to modify my systems, force me to turn over my SSL communications simply so that they can collect the information that I had no obligation to collect. Congress has only authorized law enforcement to collect this information. They have, Congress has not authorized law enforcement to go in and bulldoze small businesses simply in their effort to conduct an investigation into a suspect. And that's really what I'm trying to make clear is that laws and obligations in this country are really the responsibility and purview of Congress and should never be enacted into force through secret court orders that in that world, well, quite simply, that is just something that doesn't happen in a healthy democracy. So, on the technological side, you've started something called the Dark Mail Alliance. Yeah, certainly. Could you, could you tell me about that, please? When I created LavaBit, I saw what was happening with national security letters and sort of the quandary that it was putting internet service providers in, that they would have to violate users' privacy and secret without even review by a judge or go to jail. And I set out to use technology to build a system that wouldn't put me in that position, to use encryption in such a way that I wouldn't have access to users' information. And that was effectively the goal of LavaBit. And it worked for 10 years until eventually there was enough political pressure that the FBI decided to ride roughshod over the current case, case laws and statutes to violate or sort of break open that system that I had built with the sledgehammer. But if there's one thing that's important to understand, it's that the system I built 10 years ago was constrained by the limits of the existing mail protocols. That my solution was effectively forced to be isolated to the server and that I required a technology like SSL to provide a secure bridge between the user's home computer and the server and that in my effort to make security accessible to the common man, I did all of this encryption on the server itself to make it transparent, to make it ubiquitous, to make it easy to use. And what we've learned is that based on the government's interpretation of the obligations of businesses, based on their interpretation of their divine right to all information, public, private, third party, or criminal suspect, that they're willing to go to extreme lengths to compromise systems like mine. And that what we need to do as a, as a technological community is begin to shift our way of thinking from a focus on making systems work into making systems work securely. And that we really do have the fundamental technologies. We have a great enough understanding of cryptography now. 
experience designing and constructing secure protocols that we can do it. The only thing that had been stopping us is the fact that it's going to take money and support to not only build the protocols, but to build smarter servers, smarter email clients, and then convince the world to use those tools. And really what happened was I got together with Mike Jenke in Seattle at the beginning of September, and we sat down and we started talking about the situation with email. And we talked about the fact that they also had a server-based encryption system that was in place to protect their users' private information. And that really in this world, where the government feels like it has a divine right, that those systems were no longer sufficient to protect the privacy of users. And what we agreed is that just based on the platform, based on the attention that our two companies had, that we were really in a unique position to give to the world the technology to talk privately once again. And that between us, our experience was sufficient to build systems that would be easy enough for grandma to use, while at the same time being secure enough that even a tyrannical government or a dictator wouldn't be able to violate the privacy of those users, at least en masse. Obviously, if there's a human standing over my shoulder, it doesn't matter how secure any system is. If I'm reading the message, they will be able to, too. But at least what we can do is we can force them to target the individuals in a conversation and remove their ability, no matter how great their resources, to conduct surveillance en masse. And that's what we've been working towards is building or designing that protocol and then hopefully starting next year building those tools and releasing them as open source software so that if there can't be a lava bit there can be a hundred lava bit like services spread throughout the world okay. and that's really the goal and that's what I've been working on Okay, um, I think I understood what you said, but for our uh, less technically oriented viewers, could you explain what a protocol is and why it makes that revolutionary difference? Certainly. Um, and to do that, I need to start by explaining the problem with the tools that we have today. And it's the simple fact that we have, like I said, the ability to do end-to-end -end encryption with email today. But the real problem is the only people who are sophisticated enough, technologically inclined enough to know how to use those tools are cryptographers, are geeks, are nerds, are people who work with computers on a daily basis. That the people who need those capabilities the most, the lawyers, the doctors, the political activists, the nonprofit groups operating abroad on hostile territory or in hostile territory. They don't have these tools. That right now the only two pe groups of people on this planet who know how to talk securely are cryptographers and criminals. And what we need to do is we need to make these technologies easier to access. We, may, we need to make them happen automatically under the covers. And to do that, we need to build a language that computers can use to communicate with each other securely, regardless of who's listening and regardless of who handles the information in transit. And that's what something like dark mail is designed to do. It's designed to secure an email message on your computer in such a way that it can't be read until it reaches the other end and is on the recipient's computer. And that what we need to do by changing the language is make it possible for someone to use an email client that looks exactly like what they're used to today, but still 
carry out that encryption when they hit send without any extra cognitive burden. Um, I'd love to pursue this topic further, uh, but that's not what we're actually here for. So I hope at some point we'll get to chat. Uh, I'll get to talk, pick your brains a bit about the technical stuff more than we have time for today. Well, Alexander, um, we've but, talked a little bit about the legal and the technological, but I think it would be unfair to stop without talking about the political. Do we have time? Um, we, I suppose we could, but I want to make sure we can get to the moral issue, back to the moral issues around surround, right. shutting sure. down. Certainly, so I'll, I'll be brief in that. You know, I've not stopped my efforts at just the courts and the technology, but I've been doing everything I can to talk to the people and the politicians. Because the courts can only do so much. Technology can only do so much. That ultimately the real goal is to have Congress change the rules of the game and to force a new attitude upon law enforcement that they can't collect information in bulk that they need to return to the ways of old and begin to target individuals once again. Individuals that they have some strong suspicion of wrongdoing. Okay. So you mentioned another businessman you're working with. That's the guy from Silent Circle, correct? Certainly. I'm not only collaborating with their CEO, Mike Janke, but two of their co-founders. Names that anyone who's been around email cryptography for, for, for a while will recognize. And that's John Callis and Phil Zimmerman, two men very experienced in the art of designing secure protocols and very experienced in the art of developing email encryption software. And my hope is that by collaborating with them, we bring together a collection of knowledges, knowledge and experience to accomplish a goal that is arguably very difficult. Phil Zimmerman is that name I actually write. Is that the creator of PGP? It certainly is. Um, the godfather of cryptography. Political cryptography, I should say. Cryptography for the masses. Wow. Um, um, and that's ultimately why I decided to partner with Silent Circle, is that there are a number of people working on this problem. And I've talked to as many as I've been able to. But I felt that here were two guys that if I teamed up with, I could hopefully, collectively, have a strong enough voice that we would be able to convince the world that it's time to make the switch to a new protocol. Because what you have to realize is that there have been billions of dollars invested over the years in email systems that will all be broken when dark mail comes out. They will continue to function in parallel. But the hope is that we can move users on an increasingly on an increasing basis over from the traditional SMTP world into the dark mail world and that we need to convince businesses and users to make that switch and endure the pain and redesign their products and services to function within the limits of the new system and that by com combining my efforts with John and Phil that hopefully, like I said, collectively, we'd have enough credibility to convince the world that the time is now. Do you think that other businesses should be shutting down rather than turning information over to the government? For example, should the major cell phone providers, wh whom we have he now heard, uh, have been presenting uh, Location data. Should they all shut down? Excellent question, Alexander, because it's it brings to the fore so many important issues. Because on the one hand, you have the legal domestic col mass collection efforts, the ones that we hear about, programs like Prism and Carnivore and things like that, that 
effectively are scooping up massive amounts of telecommunications under the auspices of the FISA court. But on the other hand, you also have, you know, situations where the NSA is going out abroad and spying on American companies overseas in a hope to, hope to avoid the sort of protections that are in place for businesses that operate wholly on domestic soil. And then you have really the second half of this coin, which is the newest thing that we've uncovered, and that's the voluntary collaboration of the CIA with AT&T, where AT&T is effectively selling as a business transaction the information that they collect and have access to, to the CIA. And because it's simply a business transaction and not done under the auspices of any law or court, there are no safeguards. So if you're asking me what do I think, well I think what AT&T was doing was wholly immoral, was effectively criminal. And I can certainly say I'm never going to willingly use another AT&T product or service again as a result. But to the first half of that, to the stuff that is authorized by the auspices of a court, well, what we have to remember is that there's this law called CALEA. And I believe that stands for Communications oh, Access for Law Enforcement Officers, something along those lines. But it was passed several years ago, and effectively what it requires is phone companies to have that... It, it, places upon them that obligation that I spoke of earlier, that phone companies in the U.S. have a requirement in law that says they need the ability to tap any individual telephone call that their network carries. And what's happened is, in practice, these systems have become big enough and automated to the point that, like we were discussing, law enforcement could scoop up every call and every piece of information without even people at that business knowing. You know, we have that story that came out earlier in the summer where the NSA accidentally started recording and analyzing every call going into Washington, D.C. instead of, by accident, every call going into Egypt. Like one is significantly better than the other. <laughs> but what ultimately bothers me the most is the realization that they were able to do that on accident. That the systems have become so automated and the process so streamlined from oversight or it shielded from oversight that nobody even noticed, at least right away until the NSA caught their error themselves. And to me, that's wrong. But unfortunately, I don't think telephone companies like Sprint and Verizon have much of a choice given the purview of the current statutes. And that's why my, my political efforts are so important. Because the only way we can change that the only way we can fix those obligations is through Congress. Well, you say they have no choice, but surely there's no law compelling them to stay in business should they shut down, as you did. I think that's a personal choice that every business needs to make. And if we look again to, the, to, to companies like Facebook, Apple, Microsoft, Yahoo, Verizon, Sprint, that they have shareholders. They're public companies. Do the CEOs of those companies really have the right to shut down those businesses and light them on fire in the same way that I did in protest over what's going on, or is there greater obligation
to their shareholders who actually own the company. I think it's important to remember that the only reason I was able to make the decision that I did was because Lavabit was a wholly owned single owner LLC. It was not a public company. It was not a partnership. I hadn't taken on venture capital. And that I made that, dis that choice 10 years ago specifically so that I could ensure that Lavabit would always remain true to its philosophical underpinnings. That I decided to do things the hard way and grow it organically. But like I said, I don't think other businesses like those large companies really have that sort of freedom. But what I do know is that they are in fact doing everything they can to fight the requirements that are being placed upon them. The only problem is they're losing and they're losing in secret and they're facing the same dilemma that I did when I was forced to turn over my keys in secret in that they can't go to the world and ask for their help to change the system itself. And I think that's right now the most important thing that they're fighting for is this ability to at least disclose how much information they're giving away in secret. You used the phrase, set it on fire. Was that an allusion to something in particular? Well, I believe you are a member of the Atlas Society, right? Hopefully enough of your viewers will understand. I've heard that you actually have compared yourself to the figure of Alice Wyatt and Atlas Shrugged. Why do you choose him in particular? Comparison is always a loaded word because he is definitely on a different field, playing field, than myself. But what I can say is that that story, even though it was fictional, inspired me to the beliefs that I have. That like I said earlier, at the beginning, I didn't start Lava Bit because I wanted to set up a company to spy on Americans. I set up a company because I wanted to solve a problem and provide a service for my customers and to really give them something that they were having trouble finding elsewhere. And that in doing so, I would earn a living. And that really what happened was the government came in and eliminated, eliminated my ability to do that. And that with that being the case, I felt like the best decision I could make would be to shut the system down. Because like I said, if I wanted to snoop on people for the FBI, I would have applied to become an FBI agent. But instead I chose to become a small business owner and provide a service that I felt was fundamentally important to any true democracy. That we can give up all of our rights, little by little, but the one protection we have, the one thing that truly guarantees our ability to one day reclaim some of these rights that we've given up over the years, is our ability to talk about our losses and convince our fellow man of how important it is to reclaim some of those rights. And that's really why I felt so strongly in the necess necessity of a private email communications company like Lavabit. And I think in many ways, Ellis Wyatt thought the same thing, that he did not build his oil company. He did not work 20 hour days in the high heat and low oxygen levels of those mountains just to hand everything over to the government and let them destroy everything that he had built. And I think he made that difficult decision, the same one that I did, which is that it was better 
to destroy it himself, and in my case, myself, than to become that puppet of a system he can no longer believe in. And, you know, it's not something I developed just this summer. It's obviously stems from a set of political and moral beliefs that I've developed over the course of my entire lifetime. And it's, it's really, truly what keeps me comfortable in my own skin. I've uh, so what, stripped what, you of words. Yeah, that, that was a very impressive statement just now. Um, what lesson do you think other people, and other, you know, particularly other businessmen, should draw from what you've done? Well, I have to quote my grandfather, who was a retailer for many, many years, and who I spent many days traveling with in the summer growing up in his motorhome as we went across the country. And I can't begin to estimate the number of times that he would say, the customer is always right. He said it enough times that I internalized it, that I believe that at a fundamental level that the only reason businesses can and do exist is to service the needs of their, their customers. And that as a result, at least for me ethically and morally, I was uncomfortable operating a business which did the exact opposite, which violated the rights of its customers and acted in ways against their interest while still collecting money from those very same customers. But like I said, that's a political belief. That's an ethical belief. That's a moral belief. Every businessman will have a different view of what their obligations are. And if I can say anything to the balance of the ethical equation, it's that I've been slightly disturbed by how, at least in the last 30 or so years, companies have really been willing to sacrifice their obligations to their customers in exchange for their obligations to their shareholders. And that what that really means is that they've been willing to act against the interests of their users or without their users or customers' permission in ways that are designed to increase their bottom line. And that there's truly a delicate balance between what we can do and what we should do. And as a business, that equation and those stakes are magnified further because we're entrusted with certain things and certain responsibilities. And that we need to, again, balance that equation between our necessity and desire to earn a living and build a business against the needs and wants and interests of the customers who provide us the money to do so. Do you, do you think your decision has a broader relevance to people who are not in business? Uh, in terms of saying, you know, this is when I'm going to draw a line against the government and just not do what it wants? Well, I can say that hopefully my story becomes an inspiration to people in business and out of it who are faced with situations like my own. That they can look to me and those that came before me, like Phil, who have been willing to put their freedom on the line for the rights of others, who've been willing to make the sacrifice, 
more specifically, the sacrifices that were needed to create, found, and build this country into what it is today. That there was a time when America was the land of the free and the home of the brave. And that what we've become by neglecting the political process that created this country is the land of government-sponsored surveillance and home of the scared. And my only hope is that there are enough patriots, enough true American citizens left in the world to move us back across that river into the country that symbolized freedom and the ability or and the country that provided its citizens with the ability to pursue happiness that it once did. But that's again an individual decision because what I did and what I went through was certainly not easy. And it's it's I guess it's important to say that you can't fault any particular individual for making a different decision when faced with the same circumstances. You know, we often like to ask the question or make the statement that if put in that very same position, I would do the same thing or make the same choice. But the reality is events like they did in my case are so rare and transpire so quickly that it's truly impossible for everyone to come to the same conclusions that I did. And that without the benefit of peer review, without the benefit of peer discussion, these decisions become incredibly difficult to get right. And as a businessman with 10 years of your life invested in something, or as a private citizen with the whole of your psyche invested in something, it becomes incredibly difficult to, in a moment, push a big red button and destroy it all. And that when you're faced with that situation, you look for every reason, every excuse to not make that difficult decision. I know I faced that very same problem in evaluating the needs of my customers, in trying to think about what it is that they want, and hearing things like I did from the lead prosecutor that basically said to the effect, we will only collect the information that we're authorized to do so, and anything outside of that would actually be a crime. And that no law enforcement officer, no sanctioned member of the state would do such a thing, would breach the public trust. And when I heard that, it was ironically enough, only a month before we learned that there were almost 2,800 such instances at the NSA alone last year. And those are the ones that were reported or caught. But when faced with that statement and trying to decide whether or not I should destroy my livelihood, I have to admit, I'm not perfect. I was tempted to believe him. And that I still wonder if perhaps I should have. And then I wake up <laughs> and I realize that if all they really wanted was the information they were authorized to collect, then they would have accepted any of the plethora of compromises that I had offered. And that ultimately the only way I could have protected my user's privacy in mass was to shut down the service in the way that I did. 
that the only way I could change the system was to post the letter that I did to lavabit.com and hope that enough people would see it and that without my ability to explain why, still support me in my effort to change the way things work via the courts. But there's a very scary thing, Alexander, that I think a lot of people may have missed. If I had been approached by the FBI a year ago, I likely would have made the very same decision that I did. And I would have posted a letter very similar to the one that I posted. But that in the end, the world would have never noticed, would have never understood that I'm sure there have been people who have come before me who have made similar decisions, but because of their restrictions on speech and their desire to remain free, they didn't speak out quite in such a loud voice as I did and weren't given nearly the stage that I was simply because of the actions that we've learned about throughout this summer of Snowden. You know, and that's important to remember that I'm not the first and hopefully not the last, that the only reason the world heard my story, if at all, is because of its timing. Well, it's timing and the suspicion as to the identity of the target. You know, a lot of people have a lot of different theories about who the target was, whether it was a he or a she, an it or that. And the truth is that I didn't stand up to protect one person. I stood up to protect everyone that used my service. And that it was only comfort in that knowledge that I was even able to offer the compromise solutions that I did. You know, another thing that hasn't been talked about nearly as much as it should be is the fact that when the FBI first approached me in that June 28th meeting, I agreed to allow them to install that tap, the pen, trap, and trace device that they were authorized to. But in my effort to be helpful, I told them that I feared it wouldn't collect all of the information they were seeking because it was protected with SSL. Something I obviously regret now. But that when they first approached me, they insinuated very clearly that they were going to be collecting content and stated as a matter of fact that they would collect passwords so that they could bypass the encrypted storage system that I had developed and the protection that it offered. And it wasn't until I had retained counsel a week and a half later and had a subsequent conference call with the Department of Justice lawyers based out of Washington, D.C., that it became clear that what the impression I had been given, both by the FBI agents in my home office and by my interpretation and understanding of the order itself, that they were only entitled to meta information. They were only entitled to learn who these accounts were talking to, when they were talking to them, and when and from where these accounts were being accessed, that they were in fact not entitled to any information that could be called content, that they were in fact not entitled to collect anything remotely resembling the passwords of these users. And it was only upon learning that, and again, like I said, being faced 
with the harm that would have been caused by shutting down the service without warning. That I was able to sell myself on the idea of a compromise. Because I live in this country too. I rely on its police force to protect me and my property rights. That I don't want to see those protections destroyed and a return to anarchy. That I believe in the rule of law and more importantly, the protections established by our Constitution. And that when faced with an order authorized by a judge, I was not facing nearly the same decision that I would have been with a secret national security letter that was only approved administratively. And so I was comfortable philosophically with providing just that meta information that they were authorized to collect. But once again, I wasn't doing it to protect the single person. I wasn't doing it to protect the group of people that were being investigated. I did it because I had an obligation to protect everyone. A lot of what you're doing uh, has is in what might be called uh, the traditional sphere of activism, you know, trying to get laws changed, litigating through the courts, and so forth. Uh, a sphere in which people are used to seeing primarily uh, professional activists be active. Um, what do you think your story says about the role and the potential role of businessmen in a free society and in protecting a free society? Well, I think when it comes to activism, there's no such thing as a businessman. There's no such thing as a lawyer or a doctor, a mother or a father. All there really is is an American and a citizen and that it's the responsibility of every American and every citizen to protect their country from their government. And that's all I was trying to do. Now, if there's one thing I can credit, let me back up. If there's one thing that's important to realize is that oftentimes when people attempt to challenge the system in the way that I did. The system turns on them. And these people who are not trying to protect themselves, but in fact their country and their society, get put in jail. Get their businesses taken from them. Get all of their assets and wealth, their families, their friendships, taken from them and held over their heads with the simple command, play ball or else, and that no man, however strong, can hold out for very long under those conditions, short of the most extreme of our citizens, short of people like me and some of those that came before me who are willing to sacrifice everything, sacrifice even the right to live in our own country for those freedoms. And that when you realize that, it becomes far easier to understand why there aren't more examples of other citizens standing up in the very same way that I did. There have been some. There have been even more in the wake of my decision. 
but that there have also been a number who have paid the price. You know, I, I wasn't able to tell my friends what was going on, but I did say to one of them, the FBI has approached me and asked me to do something I'm completely uncomfortable with and I don't know what to do. And what my friend said is, you should do exactly what they're asking of you. And sent me a link to the story of the Quest CEO and how he attempted to stand up for the rights of Americans and play within the rules of the system and that for his trouble was disgraced and sent to jail while even at the same time being deprived the right of a full and fair hearing because the true backstory of his situation couldn't even be told in court without violating the law. That he had been subject to classified briefings and other classified discussions and that it was only based on that classified information that he chose to sell his a portion of his stake in his own company and that the only reason he didn't follow the rules required by a person in his position was because he wasn't allowed to. But the jury couldn't hear that. And I read that story. And the first decision I had to make was, am I willing to go to jail to defend my country and the Constitution that's supposed to govern it? And being the person that I am, and being without a family right now, a wife and children, a home to provide for. It was probably an easier decision for me to make than most. And it was quite simple. If going to jail is what it took to defend the Constitution, then I was willing to make that sacrifice. But can you really fault others for not believing in the same? Depends what the question is that they're dealing with, I suppose. It depends what they're being asked to do. It's a very important point. Um, you know, we, our country and our citizenry certainly wouldn't condone the obvious. It wouldn't condone a world in which courts issued secret orders to rape, pillage, and murder. So why should it condone this practice of willfully and intentionally violating the protections of the Constitution and the guarantees to privacy that were provided for in it? But that a question such as the one that came before me whether or not it was right and proper, due and just, to turn over this property of mine, this information, if you will, that was generated at my own expense, both in computing resources and money, to the government, so that they could fulfill their obligation to conduct criminal investigations. It's really a very nuanced issue. And that in situations like that, the right decision is not always clear. That it was only because of my thorough, all too thorough, if you will, understanding of history. And it's only because I had 10 years to think about what I would do when faced with that decision that I was able to make 
the right choice. You know, when I say history, it's important to remember we don't have to look very far into our country's own history to find a senator and a congressional committee, specifically the one on un-American activities, that tried to do something very similar to what the administration is today asking Americans to spy on other Americans in secret and divulge their private conversations with them to the state. We don't have to look very far in our own history to find an FBI director who was willing and able to use the in information gained during lawfully investigate, uh, sorry, lawfully carried out investigations and surveillance operations simply for political gain. And that if we look even further beyond our own borders, we don't have to look very far, both in history and geography, to find countries that have been willing and able to oppress their own citizenry. And that if someone like that ever truly came to power here in the United States, that these systems that have been put in place would make it all but impossible for the people to do their duty. And not everybody, I guess, has that same perspective and that same understanding. Which is part of the reason I continue to stand on my soapbox and speak. You know, my job now is not that of a business owner, but it is that of a political activist. And the job of any activist is to educate the people and help them understand what is right and why it's so important. I just hope I'm up to the task. That is always the challenge of uh, making sure that we don't become as in the words of the journalist who famously took on the senator to whom you were referring a continental island off the coast of Cham Kamchatka. Uh, I don't know if you've read Morrow's Freedom House speech. Not, not all of it, no. Um, I believe I read part of it a very long time ago, but, um, you know, I think what also disturbed me so much in going through this fight is just how little we understood about what our government was doing. And then if one thing we've realized is that when it comes to violating the Constitution, at least the American federal government has gotten very smart about how they go about doing it. And that if they want to violate the Constitution, apparently all they need to do is make it illegal for anyone who knows about the violation of the Constitution to speak out about it. And that by doing so, they create a world in which someone has to be willing to go to jail just to say, quite simply, I think what's going on is wrong. So how is it that you have managed to be on your soapbox and be all over the country and not be in jail? <laughs> In truth, I think it has a lot to do with luck. Specifically, you know, the very specifics of my story and my situation. 
you know, before I shut down the company. I was certainly threatened with arrest, although I never bothered to ask them under what law or what charge. But the simple fact was they could have come and picked me up for nothing. They could have accused my willingness to adjudicate as being a, a mere obstruction of justice. And that the only reason they probably didn't go further in their draconian witch hunt, if you will, is because I think they understood in a two-person company, if they had arrested me, the system would have shut down on its own without somebody available to maintain it. That if I had been as a member of a larger organization, that there would have in fact been no real motivation for not arresting me, for not coming up with a trumped up charge. And that if there's anything that has protected me and protected my decision to shut down, it's been the media coverage that I've been lucky enough to receive. Because that coverage has provided a certain measure of insulation from them taking any retaliatory action against me. That effectively all they've been limited to is rhetoric in their legal filings. Statements that are at best amusing and at worst horrifying. Such as? The statement that by calling my service secure, I have no right to feel exempt from the government's duty to conduct surveillance during the course of criminal investigations, which is a complete perversion of everything I stand for and attempted to do. I did argue that by turning over these keys, I would be destroying the trust and credibility of my company, particularly by doing it in secret, and that ultimately I would pay a price financially, but that the reason I called my system secure wasn't a marketing ploy. It was because, in fact, my system was so secure that all of their traditional methods for gathering information didn't work. That the only reason they were forced to make this extreme or to take such an extreme action is because my system was immune, was secure from particularly the type of privacy violations and mass surveillance that they had been conducting on other, less secure systems. That's why I refer to it as rhetoric. That their definition of my statutory obligation to install a device is coupled with an unwritten obligation to make that device effective. That I have an obligation to change, if you will, alter, if you will, my systems and provide them with any information at my disposal to them just to make their device success, um, effective. <laughs> Effectively what they're arguing is that they can force any company, any American provider of goods and services designed to protect the privacy of its user and its customer into modifying and violating the protections of those very systems. You know, we, we like to think that service providers are in a unique and different situation than software developers. But the simple fact is those obligations that they sort of push forward, the precedent that they're hoping to set 
is that even software developers, companies like Microsoft, have an obligation to modify the software that they ship to its customers in such ways that it becomes possible to conduct secret surveillance on those very users these systems were supposed to be designed to protect. That a number of people in the community have criticized me and my decisions and calling my system secure, but failed to realize that their systems under such a precedent would be equally insecure. That based on what the government is arguing, they could go to a company like Microsoft, demand its source code and its encryption keys, and then secretly and subvertly modifying a small component of an operating system that everybody depends upon and then using the encryption keys of Microsoft to push that very vulnerability out indiscriminately to the population of the world. That there are effectively no limits on the precedent or sort of argument that the government is trying to make. And it's, it was a equally entertaining and frightening experience to read through that brief and come to that realization. Because, you know, if there's one thing I also feared was that if my story ever did come to light, if I ever was able to speak out that they wouldn't continue to make the same dramatic and horrifying statements that they did orally and verbally in private conversations. You know, it took them almost two and a half weeks to put their demand for my SSL keys down in writing that for two and a half weeks I was going to lawyers without any evidence of what they were trying to actually accomplish. <clears throat> and the only thing I can think of is that their unwillingness to do that was their hope that I would win this victory and that if I had ever come out and complained afterwards they could simply say I chose to do it that no such demand was ever made. It's, it was a pretty scary situation to be in. To, to have a federal prosecutor tell me, do I really think my users, my customers, trust me, trust LavaBit, more than the federal government and its Federal Bureau of Investigation? <coughs> And that they actually took offense when I said yes. That to them, I appeared both an extremist and a radical simply because of that one belief. Now, it's certainly understandable how a human in that position could come to that conclusion. Because nobody believes that they could be corrupted. Nobody believes that they would be responsible for violating the public trust. That I truly believe that the lawyers and the FBI agents involved were fully convinced that everything they did was right and proper. That everything they did was in the interest of conducting a criminal investigation, a duty and responsibility that they are certainly tasked with. But that in doing so, they lost sight of what they were supposed to be protecting. That the reason the oath of office, the one that they all were sworn to, says they have a responsibility to defend the Constitution from all enemies, both foreign and domestic, is precisely because they face 
that very important duty of domestic defense against violations of the Constitution. That, like I said earlier, it's almost sad that the very people we entrust and depend upon to defend the Constitution from the sort of domestic overreach that we've now become a party to, they were unwilling and unable to do it. And it's hard to and know so which would be scary. People, people deliberately doing wrong doing things, wrong with, that things with that kind of power, power knowing, knowing that it was wrong, wrong with people, or people doing everything, doing that, everything they've done, that they've done and thinking and that it's thinking exactly, that it's what, exactly they what, what they ought to be doing. Yeah. You know, equally as scary as the notion that all of these ethically dubious programs were in existence. And if you could get away with making the argument the American public shouldn't know about them, I'd be hard-pressed to understand their belief that they, those very programs should also be kept secret from the members of Congress who authorize the money to fund those programs. You know, it's one thing to keep nuclear launch codes secret from members of Congress and to use this system of classified information for that purpose. It's wholly another to use the authority of the Espionage Act and the ability to classify information to avoid the political consequences of an ethically improper action. You know, I've, I've talked about this so much at this point that in the process I've realized certain things. that, for one, Obama was, a, as a civil liberties attorney, as a member of the minority in the United States, as a man tasked with the duty of defending the rights of the people, before becoming president, spoke out against the very surveillance that's being conducted. And that part of the problem we face as activists in trying to make the public aware of what's going on is the fact that Obama is so skillfully and expertly done everything in his power to diffuse and inhibit any fear that might have developed otherwise. That as a civil liberties attorney, he can use phrases like independent oversight and adequate safeguards and truly in the defense of our nation as tools to convince the American public that what is going on is in their own interest and doesn't pose nearly as serious a threat to our liberty as people like me have been trying to say. The Godfather, Phil, told me something that I've also taken to heart which is that Obama, as a junior senator, was not adequately equipped, was not strong enough to stand in a room filled with five-star generals, with the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and be read in to all of these classified programs and to hear the one-sided rhetoric of the bureaucrats responsible for their administration and still be able to stand up and say this is wrong. 
And it's, it's a really unfortunate thing because there truly is no way of knowing if whoever we elect next will be strong enough to make that very difficult decision, to go against the grain, to be in a room filled with very important, very intelligent individuals and be the only one willing to stand up and say no. And yet it's the president's job to unilaterally say no. Um. Particularly in a situation like this where nobody else even has the opportunity to. But also, you know, I mean, when you talk about Congress, the thing that the thing that strikes me is first of all, you know, anybody involved in our political system, certainly any lawyer, and many members of Congress are lawyers, as am I, um, is supposed to have an understanding of the notion uh, that the system is designed to restrain people in power. Is supposed to have an understanding of the idea that even if you trust a guy in a the guy who's in a position today, tomorrow you may not trust the guy who's there. The Constitution wasn't designed to protect the majority. It was designed to protect the minority. It was designed to protect the people who didn't have the votes because they were a small cadre of individuals. And it was designed to protect them from being ridden over roughshod by Congress and the majority. And that it's unfortunate that enough years have passed since we've been tasked with the duty of sacrificing our lives in defense of that notion that we've also lost our ability as a society to understand its importance. That freedom ultimately means the ability to make a decision that somebody else would agree disagree with. And, and that's why the Constitution isn't even really fundamentally about protecting minorities. It's about protecting the smallest minority on earth, as Rand put it, the individual. Yes, and protecting their individual rights. And that, I'm sure as a constitutional law lawyer, you're familiar with all of the cases over the years and all of the laws that have come to, come to light over the years that illustrate that this was not a transition that happened overnight. That it was something that happened little by little, piece by piece. And that because of that, no single generation was ever faced with anything quite so shocking as to revolt. And by revolt, I don't mean pick up guns and go shoot people, but v revolt at the ballot box. Revolt in the words that they publish in their papers and their articles and advocate a return to the very principles that were supposed to be at the core of our country. That the most important decisions were supposed to be made by our local municipalities, in our city halls, in our town halls, in our county courthouses. That fewer decisions should be made at the state and even fewer still decisions should be made at the federal level. You know as a businessman I've learned one very important lesson that's the farther you are away from any situation both geographically and cognitive, cognitively the less equipped you are to make the right decision. And that so many of the things and problems that our government tries to solve 
can't be solved effectively and adequately and properly and correctly at the federal level. That the only p true people who understand those problems and how to deal with them are the people on the front lines. And that it's in fact the duty of the politicians not to make the decisions for them, but to ensure that they only have the resources and the tools necessary and at their disposal to solve the problems in a way that will benefit all. <laughs> and it's, it's unfortunately a lesson that so few of the people who make those decisions in Washington, D.C. seem to understand and believe. <laughs> and I don't know how to teach it to them. <laughs>